So I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, another uh, great evening of uh, presentations. We're, we're back virtually in the United States on our Insights World Tour, uh, presented through Ortho Evidence. Uh, just reminding everyone, these are by uh, design small group interactive sessions in which we encourage participation through both audio and video interaction with our guest speakers. Uh, so we will at this point um, begin with a short presentation and, and let me give you uh, just some of the ground rules of how we're going to be planning on, on moving forward. So this event is recorded. So just a reminder to those that it will be recorded. So we, the full transcripts and, and recording will be available at a later date. Um, when the speakers are actually presenting, we hope that you will stay muted and off video yeah, so we can stay focused on the presenters. Um, the other thing that I think we'll, we'll also ask you to do is once we finish the presentation, we'll open it up um, for uh, discussion. I'll certainly uh, have lots of questions as I uh, usually typically do, but we'll be encouraging uh, you know, answers and questions from yourself as well to both of our uh, speakers. So we'll encourage that as we uh, get moving. But without further ado, we are here this evening to discuss and debate, is it time for a large RCT in the management of tibial plateau fractures? And who else uh, but to speak about this topic, uh, but Professor Mark Swinkowski, I suspect does not require much of an introduction, current editor-in-chief of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, a uh, mentor of mine, a friend, a colleague, and certainly a, a very respected um, academic and scholar uh, in the area. So, we also have uh, a guest, uh, Mai Noin, who uh, is an assistant professor also in the Department of Surgery, who will be uh, presenting and co-presenting with Dr. Swinkowski and look forward to uh, both their presentations as we uh, begin this uh, journey of tibial plateau fracture. And clearly there's gonna be some discussion it looks like around where we go next. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor Mark Swinkowski. Mark? Great. Uh Mo, thanks uh, to you and the OE team for inviting me to participate uh, in the world tour, and in particular, to allow me to talk about a clinical topic, because Lord knows I talk too much about scholarly publication and rather tired of it. So I want to talk about a topic that really has uh, energized me in terms of a new technique for managing a rather common fracture uh, in our practices. And it's kind of like... Um, a, a tab, I'm gonna share the screen here, if I can. It is, uh, everybody see that okay? Uh, yep, perfect. Okay, great. Um, this is a uh, like an example of two different approaches uh, for a common fracture that come out of two different subspecialties. <clears throat> and there are some types of procedures where there's easy cross-fertilization, but I have to say that we in the orthopedic trauma community are really resistant to anything that has to do, to, uh, to do with using our, an arthroscope for anything. And I was no different than anyone else. And here, here are some of the, let's see if I can advance the slide. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not advancing. Huh. Just Mark, maybe just click it. See, so maybe just, you know, if, if you just press the cursor and then it starts moving afterwards once you've- Yeah, there yeah, we go. There, yeah, thanks right. very much. No worries. Yeah, so everybody knows about uh, those. I, I really, I'm, I'm not allowed to have any conflicts of interest as a JBJS editor. So there's really nothing uh, related to industry here. So these are the things I would say, as I suspect most of the orthopedic traumatologists would say, if I want to do procedures with all over the place, I would have gone into urology. Uh, any portal less than three inches is not real surgery. Uh, which end of the scope goes into the patient anyway? Uh, and all the guys that uh, do this type of work do it because they like the smell of the locker room. So I, I said these uh, kind of things, uh, like many of you on the, on the uh, Zoom do, until about uh, six or seven years ago when I had to come to some stark realization uh, about the management of these fractures. So let me just do a, a bit of history here. This is the classic reference on uh, conservative care from Rasmussen, published in the journal, followed 183 patients for 7.3 years, no difference in the functional outcomes based on the amount of articular depression, and there was no correlation between residual articular depression and arthrosis. And then a longer follow-up, up to 20 years, and the same sort of findings, no changes in functional outcome for the original study, 
seven years, 87% good to excellent, 20 years, 90% good or excellent. So that's kind of the baseline for conservative care. And there've been many, many uh, subsequent publications primarily recommending ORIF. And we have, I think, drifted as a subspecialty toward lock plates. Um, this is a common x-ray that uh, I certainly have seen in my practice. The plate is on and the fracture is not well reduced. Uh, there's a one on the, on the other side that is a, a non-lock plate, um, which um, shows perhaps a little better reduction. And there is a cost difference between those two. And here's the common approach we all use now for the bicondylar, posterior medial approach for the usually larger uh, medial fragment and then an anterior lateral approach uh, for the split depression type. Uh, and you can see the distractor and the, the pelvic reduction forceps. Uh, and here's the classic lateral approach uh, that we use taking down the anterior compartment and you see the sutures in the meniscus that after we've resected the meniscal tibial ligaments and uh, more about that in a moment. So why the heck would I be risking being ostracized for my trauma brethren uh, to uh, recommend arthroscopically assisted ORF? Well, a few simple reasons. I had to really admit seven years ago that you can't see the posterior half of the articular surface, no matter how much pressure you put on the femoral distractor in a headlamp and et cetera, et cetera. You really can't receive, you can't see it well. Uh, I never really like cutting those meniscal tibial ligaments in the first place. I always worried about it. It, uh, it seems to be unnecessary. And the number of cases, I showed you an example where the post-op images are disappointing is actually quite large if we're honest with ourselves. And most patients have significant symptoms from the plates, particularly the lateral locking plates. So those are the things I had to admit. Furthermore, there is a substantial percentage of patients with soft tissue injuries as well. This is Mike Gardner's study from 16 years ago. And you can see the percentages of meniscal pathology. Uh, in our ex experience, about 20% actually have detachment from the capsule of the lateral meniscus incarcerated in the fracture. Uh, and you can see 44% had medial meniscal tears, which you generally don't visualize with an open approach. And some had tears of the posterior lateral corner. So uh, it's pretty clear to me that a CT scan is uh, very useful to us as we plan our, our surgery. And in the past, using the open approach, uh, people have recommended the lateral approach to make a small window in a, in a pure depression type to tamp up the, the depressed articular surface. But you cannot, with the lateral approach, really get far lateral uh, with this. And this is something that Bruce Levy, one of my former partners at Regents Now at Mayo Clinic, uh, showed me about 15 years ago that by placing a pin and making the hole on the medial side for the arthroscopically assisted reduction that you can do a much, much better job. So these are some of the studies. Uh, Maya has done a really nice job with the meta-analysis. I'll let her address that perhaps. Uh, and this is just a, a couple of, of small cohort studies showing pretty reasonable reductions with arthroscopically reduced fractures. But I would point out to the audience that again, most of these are with a lateral window and not with a medial window to elevate the joint uh, piece. So I'm going to skip through these. And we'll deal with these in the discussion. But here, here was my initial cohort study evaluation, which we published in a lower impact journal uh, after the, the first experience uh, where I really wanted to look at what was going on. So here you can see 27 patients, uh, 15 males, 12 females, uh, a, a wide age range. Uh, one bicondylar, which I'll show you, uh, 15 Schatzker 2 and 11 type 1. We were able to uh, get patients examined at uh, 70%. Uh, only two patients lacked a very few degrees of extension with really vigorous uh, examination of them in the lateral view. Um, 14 had no pain, 13 had minimal pain, uh, most with no medications or anti inflammatories. Uh, and uh, 20 with flexion greater than 130 degrees, and there was really no loss of articular reduction. So here's the techniques, a standard arthroscopic view, uh, dealing with a medial meniscal tear if it's there, uh, planning to deal with uh, the lateral detachment if it's there. Then we use a C-arm for pin placement, again, from the medial side, with the pin aimed at the center of the depressed segment. 
we use a 10 millimeter uh, reamer to make a hole. And then we elevate the surface under the C-arm and biplanar imaging, which I'll show you patient positioning, which is very important. And then we check the reduction with the arthroscope. We use a calcium phosphate cement underneath the elevated segment. And then we use two to, I will say five now. I had one yesterday that we put five screws in in a 77 year old uh, woman. And then we use a hinge knee brace now for four weeks, initially for six, but now for four. And then we allow full weight bearing and strengthening at four weeks. So that's the protocol. Here is the setup. You see the C-arm. Uh, the patient has slid way down, the table is broken. And to get the lateral, you bring the C-arm through underneath the leg and then simply elevate it above the uh, other uh, uninjured leg. Here's the lateral view. So a couple of examples, here's a preoperative CT uh, in an intraoperative uh, post-op uh, image. You can see the calcium phosphate cement in the three screws. This is on the left side, the depressed segment kind of moving into the screen and on the right after it's elevated, you can see the meniscus nicely. Here is uh, another case uh, one year postoperatively. Uh, this is a rather dramatic case of a senior uh, division three college football player. Uh, you can see the pure depression. Uh, he had a prior ACL injury uh, and we tamped that up. I'll show you here, there's the pre and post reduction with the segment tamped up. Here is, a, I think one of the broader indications is these elderly patients with an element of osteoporosis where the area of depression can be large and substantial. I think it's much better to do this technique to preserve a normal soft tissue envelope should the patient need a total knee replacement down the pike. And uh, here you can see the elevation through the medial portal uh, and the calcium phosphate cement. We generally use three ml. And then you can see on this particular case, this was a anterior uh, footprint detachment that we had to repair with sutures in addition to elevating the uh, segment. Uh, and here she is uh, one year uh, and doing fine, not needing a total knee replacement. Here's the one by Condler and a professional snowmobile, snowmobile racer in the middle of a season. I really wanted to try the medial, uh, pardon me, the minimally invasive approach so he could complete the season and he did. Uh, and this is really, this is really pushing the envelope, I will admit. Uh, and here he is uh, at a year and a half and it was able to resume his professional racing career. Here, here are his radiographs, maybe not perfect. Um, so uh, this is that, uh, um, I'm not sure, Mai, my, my, if you're gonna discuss uh, the, the, uh, the survey that we did with the, uh, with the OTA and uh, the Science of Variation Group led by David Ring, but I'm gonna skip through this. The, the basic point is that most traumatologists find a minimal value, if any, in the use of an arthroscope. And that's really the, the essence of the uh, issue in designing and planning a, a large RCT. Uh, Mai is going to talk about the match cohort. Uh, so here's my conclusion that I, I think you can't do a Schatzker sixes, but you can perhaps with select type fives. I think I showed that. And I think 90 plus percent of these fractures are amenable to this uh, percutaneous arthroscopically assisted approach. Uh, the hardware uh, irritation is significantly less than with a lateral base lock plate. I am absolutely convinced that the reductions are superior to that done open, and the maintenance of reduction is superior. And uh, our next steps, which Mai is gonna continue on, uh, is to publish uh, the survey results, uh, which we have done, I think, a comparative cohort study, which we are finishing, uh, and we're beginning to plan the multi-center RCT. So uh, Mai Nguyen is one of my junior partners at Regions. Uh, a certified musculoskeletal traumatologist who also, I heard her say in the OR when she came in to let, let, a, let me show her how to do this, that she didn't know which end of the arthroscope went in the patient, so we had to show her as well. So Mai's going to give a brief presentation, and then we'll open it up uh, for questions and discussion. Mai, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Sonkowski. That was excellent. So 
Um, I'm really interested in uh, seeing what people think about this technique. And this is something I'm very excited about. Um, so thank you for having me. And um, I have adopted this technique and I did have doubt at the beginning, but I really have been blown away uh, on the cases I've done for patients for the visualization that I get in these cases. And I'm not a scoper, you know, I'm a fractural surgeon by training and um, did my fellowship in trauma when I use a scope zero time. Um, but there are cases I certainly have put a scope in there um, and, and then redo my reduction because the reduction, ex especially in the back, was not as good as I anticipated based on the floral. So this is the main adv advantage of the scope with excellent visualization, minimize soft tissue dissection, and um, that lead to optimum recovery outcomes for patients with early weight bearing as Dr. Sun Council yet mentioned. Um, so I just gonna talk briefly about our cohort uh, study. Um, the techniques will be published uh, by JBJS, Extensive Surgical Techniques. So you can refer to that uh, if you wanna know more details about our setup. But this is our outcomes functionally and radiographic for the past 10 years at our institution. Um, with careful selections, we had 159 patients with 66 patients in the scope group and 93 patients in the open reduction internal fixation group. And I have to say that we have expanded our indication since then. Um, but for the initial um, study, um, this was the cohort. They are very similar in terms of age, around 46, uh, 48 years old in each group, and 80% of patients were shot school two. The outcomes are very similar between the scope and the open reduction tone fixation group, with slight advantage to the scope group, mainly a tunicate TAM and TAM to weight bearing, you can see here um, at 50 days and 67 days. When we look at our subgroup analysis, we found that for patients over the age of 50, there was lower rate of joint space narrowing, 0% for the scope group. And then for patients with less than four millimeter displacement, there was 80% of patients in a scope group that rate their pain at, at zero at 80 days follow up. So I think this result is, is very encouraging. And I think that looking at the literature, um, this is a technique that is being adopted worldwide. Um, largely based on lower level of evidence as you have seen throughout tonight. Um, but because of the, that encouraging results, we're hoping that the next step that we can build a multi-center randomized control try um, and uh, get enough funding uh, to make it happen. So I, I have left my contact up there um, so that if this is something that you interested in and well, I'll just want to know or talk about this technique. I would be uh, happy to, to talk to you and um, go over cases with you if you would like. Thanks, Mai. Okay, Mo, we're ready for discussion. So why don't we go, um, okay, great. So I've got a couple of, of beginning points. So I encourage those who have uh, a question or want to get some um, directly, if you want to come on video and you can certainly ask that question to both uh, Dr. Swinkowski and Noin. But in the interim, I guess my 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 bigger question is you 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 have a provocative statement of is it, is it time for a randomized trial? So it looks like you've done you know you've done your cohort work, uh, you've done uh, it looks like you've done some systematic review work. You have a pretty good sense of where you want to go. Um, in thinking of this design, what are the outcomes of interest for you at this point? Like what are you thinking about? Or you know are are the uh, are the outcomes that you think are dramatically improved uh, using more of a percutaneous approach and an arthroscopic approach compared to the conventional two incision approach? Well, I would say the quality of reduction, um, we've got some work to do to try to figure out whether we want to try to recommend post-op CTs. As you know, yeah. anytime you make the trial more complicated, I mean, you're the world's biggest advocate mm -hmm. of large, simple trials, Mo. Yeah. So, um, so it's, it's quality of reduction. Uh, it will be difficult to have blind assessors, uh, obviously, because one has a plate and one has multiple screws. Um, uh, functional outcomes, of course, uh, range of motion, uh, time to full weight bearing, uh, time to uh, uh, unlimited 
uh, activity. And then I think one of the real advantages is uh, implant removal. Um, right. Uh, whether that that is uh, going to be uh, required. I think also we could probably do an economic analysis. Uh, my impression is that it may be uh, cost effective as well uh, to uh, to do this, but we we haven't really done the formal planning for the trial yet. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We're, no. we're working on it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it it, it seems to me that um, and a question I would ask, you know. Um, Probably uh, maybe this is directed to you, Mai. When uh, you were presented with this, you know, this this approach, how long? Like, how many cases? I guess do you think it takes to get proficient at it. Obviously, for a lot of trauma surgeons who aren't necessarily scoping all the time, um, the first question would be great if we want to take this on. What do we have to do? What would be a recommendation for someone interested in this approach? What would be the number of cases, and how would you how would you advise them to move forward? That's a great question because uh, I, I think when I start talking with this technique, a lot of patient people came up to me, surgeons said, my, my center is not going to know how to do scope. And honestly, you know, I work at region hospital and uh, when I do one of these cases, the nurses with me usually are nurses who do fracture cases. So they don't really understand the scope and the setup very well. So what I did was I did one case with Dr. Swankowski to understand the setup that he had. And really, it's quite simple. The key point is that you need to have access to a scope and you have to have the X-ray CM come in um, and be out of the way of the scope. So that's the main point. So I, I, when I understand that setup, I came to my center and adapted to the setup that worked for my center. So for my center, I use a regular table that does not break. So the leg just stay straight there. Mm -hmm. And um, I use a sterile bone foam that once I need the scope, I just need to remove it. Um, when I need to get x-ray for a lateral right. x-ray, I have the CM come over. So the setup right. is quite simple. And um, when you do the scope, it's mainly that you need to get the leg in a figure of four in order to look over the lateral side. So all the skills that I... I used to, to do this kind of surgery. I learned when I was a resident. And the yeah. last time I did a scope, I was a fourth year resident. So it's been a while, but I think once we understand the technique and that's why we want to get the, the paper published out there so that people can constantly refer to that um, and understand the setup. The learning curve for me, I saw one case done by him and I've been doing that after that. Great. And in your own mind, it was just after the first, like a couple of cases and you felt pretty comfortable well, with it. You were happy with the approach. Is it, you know, we, we just, we just did a session where we looked at a short, you know, sort of a, a short stem total uh, joint. And he said, you know, 30 to 40 cases, what he felt was the appropriate number of cases. You're, you're telling me it's under 10, you think? Yes, because what I want to emphasize that this is not a new skill, really. Yeah. You know, we learn how to scope as, as resident. What we just need to understand is how to get the scope set up with the CRM. So I think it's different from you know learning a completely new technique. This is basically just to be open to the fact that the scope can be present in a trauma operating room. And so if someone who's have never done scoping, you know, so maybe that's something that you may need to use a little bit more time, but I was never a scoper. I just know to use a camera and put the camera in there. Um, and also sometimes people get concerned about what if I put the scope in there and I see an ACL tear? Does it mean that I have to learn how to do that too? Or how, how do I repair a large meniscal tear? And for me, uh, I use a scope just to see. I don't use a scope to do the work. Um, I, I'm, I'm still a fracture surgeon. I fix a fracture like how I would fix. And if I see a large meniscal tear, I end up, doing an open arthrotomy to do that repair because in my hand it's much faster to do a meniscal repair um open but it just use a scope to, to see got it oh that makes a lot of sense uh, mark is there anything from your end you want to add to that to the discussion yeah, around learning yeah yeah just just full disclosure uh you know i am i am so old that, that when i was a <laughs> resident there there were no cameras so i don't have these skills that my and you younger people have. Uh, so I, when I do these cases, I do them with a senior resident who's, who has some scope skills, or I do them with one of the fellows, uh, sports fellows that are at our center. And uh, I have done it on my own, but it's not very pretty uh, because 
I never really earned, yeah. uh, learned learned those skills. Um, but I do, I do know the right location to make portals and things like that. Uh, just a comment, uh, my mention about doing an open approach for a lateral meniscal detachment, I do the same. I basically went in the first three to four years, I went through every single sports partner uh, in our center and brought them in to do the repair. But quite frankly, it takes forever. Uh, and the, the, the darts and the kind of inside out things that they use are extremely expensive. And we're just talking about a mini arthrotomy that's just, you know, it's it's only two centimeters, three centimeters to get a couple of uh, mm -hmm. number two, uh, I use Ethabon, not even fiber wire, uh, into the to the central portion of the meniscus and then out through the capsule. It's it very it doesn't take very long to do a, an open capsule repair, and it's usually you can do it through the same incision where the screws have been placed. Usually they're lateral to medial just uh, you know, uh, five millimeters under the articular surface. So the that you can connect that incision for the, for the cannulated screws and then work, work through that. And it's really quite simple. Can I ask you, Mark, I, I know you, you, in your, in your opening slides, you talked a little bit about, you know, that you, you, this approach isn't something that you, you know, that you, that you particularly trained on. When was that moment that you decided this is the future and we need to really uh you know do everything we can to uh promote it and discuss it evaluate it like what what was it um, like what was that sort of the history of you making that big switch because it's a fairly dramatic switch um, from the point of view of thinking about how we treat these these fractures yeah so it it happened as i transition you know with when you get really old uh then people don't want you at the level one center anymore uh and <laughs> so it was when I was transitioning out of level one care into level three care, and I started to see more osteoporotic patients, and I started to see that 65 to 70 year old with the split depression, yeah. and I just could not bring myself to put the big anterolateral scar, knowing that the risk of that patient needing an, ar ar uh, an arthroplasty was substantial. Yeah. So Bruce Levy, uh, again, I give Bruce a lot of credit because he's the one that worked out these steps at Regions 15 years ago, uh, had shown me that you can really elevate these things by approaching it from the medial side rather than underneath from the lateral side. So I just went about trying it on some of these more uh, parotic patients and was really satisfied uh, with the results. Got it. And, and you know, to that point, my your uh, data suggested, or at least the core course that you've done, suggested that the majority, I think you said 80% of patients were the split depressed type. In your mind, is that the ideal patient? Now, uh, Mark had said that, you know, he believes it can be in the types one all the way up to the fours. Where do you think the ultimate sweet spot is? Like, so if you're designing a study, would you say all patients, all comers in, or would you narrow it? So based on the data that we have, and obviously I've not done this as many as Dr. Sonkowski, but I think mainly it's gonna be shots go one to three, the lateral tibial plateau that had some depression. Um, and we did include shots go four in our cohort, but I think when I look at the data, um, that that patient, there was one single patient with shots go four and they had more of the depression form on the medial side, not the um, high energy dislocation you usually associate with type four. And all those patients have what we call a cortical envelope that is easily be restored. So you don't end up needing a big, huge plate on the lateral side and not dissecting that area out. Um, and I think they all had the gut store of that is that they all have an area of depression that can be elevated using the minimal invasive technique. 